I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a, a video lecture for my law and economics seminar. And we're going to be talking about um, this uh, evidence. This is for our unit on evidence and a specific issue that comes up in evidence and criminal procedure with the exclusionary rule. So in our legal system, uh, in criminal procedure cases, uh, we uh, the judges in the 20th century created a system of excluding certain evidence. And in some of the Supreme Court opinions, they've started to discuss um, these exclusionary rules in terms of marginal analysis or marginal deterrence. So let's take a look and see what's uh, going on here, because this is an example where the courts are talking about a specific evidentiary issue um, in, in basically in economic terms. So just by way of background, in case you haven't had criminal procedure or evidence yet in your law school uh, studies, in criminal proceedings in the United States, courts in the 20th century developed a tradition of excluding evidence at trial if the police had obtained it in violation of, of the defendant's constitutional rights. This was not a common law rule. Um, this was developed in the 20th century, basically by um, the United States Supreme Court. So even if the evidence was credible, courts would exclude it at trial to deter police misconduct or to incentivize police to actually follow the rules. Um, so concerns that police would, uh, there were concerns that the police would often violate um, rules or people's uh, uh, civil liberties or rights in order to obtain evidence for an arrest or conviction. So if the police are just completely focused on catching bad guys and arresting people that deserve it, um, bringing them to justice, they may find um, some of the constitutional protections that people have um, to be basically an obstacle to the police doing their job. And our uh, three big examples where we apply exclusionary rules uh, this is not an exclusive list, but generally our Fourth Amendment uh, search warrant requirement. So if the police just decided that they're going to break into somebody's house looking for evidence and they didn't get a, bother to get a search warrant first, um, or they force their way into a premises and conduct a search without a search warrant, um, they're, and they're ignoring their Fourth Amendment rights, the court has said that they're going to uh, suppress or exclude that evidence. Um, and under the Fifth Amendment, which the protection against self-incrimination um, or involuntary confessions, basically the um, courts adopted a, a practice of excluding confessions if the person didn't receive their Miranda warnings first, right? The, you have a right to remain silent and a right to counsel and so forth. Or if the person said, I want a lawyer, and um, as soon as they were taken into custody, and then the police basically tried to interrogate them or ask them a bunch of questions without their lawyer present. Um, and so in the, if so, even if the person confessed to the crime, we will um, that confession will be inadmissible at trial later. And on the Sixth Amendment, it's also a right to counsel um, that is uh, basically after the person has been arraigned um, and so forth. And uh, the, they have a right to have a lawyer present for um, pre-trial interrogations and um, some of the trial uh, proceedings themselves. They have a right to have counsel at trial itself. And, and so if there's evidence that's gleaned when basically the person's lawyer is being kept away from them, um, that will be excluded. Now, my students should note that there's a lot of debates about um, whether these rules are prudent and whether they actually work um, do police really care if the evidence is admissible or the defendant is acquitted? Um, there's a question, there's a lot of de lively academic debate about whether police are actually focused on just making arrests and um, or if they actually are focused on making sure the person that the conviction is going to stick there. So, for example, there is some evidence that some police departments um, promotion and um, and, and other uh, raises and bonuses and so forth depend on basically how many arrests you're making and not whether the people you arrest are actually convicted at trial. And so that can create, um, it, it may be that the, we still have insufficient incentives for um, the police to worry about getting a warrant or things like that. Cardozo, Justice Cardozo cr critiqued that saying, 
um, with one of his like witty little um, uh, statement aphorisms, the criminal is to go free because the constable has blundered. And that nicely captures a lot of the criticism of the exclusionary rule. Sometimes like we all know this person is guilty. They've already confessed to the crime and now we can't convict them because the police made a mistake and didn't get the uh, a warrant first or didn't read them their Miranda rights before they confessed and uh, so forth. And um, and people will talk about that there are too many acquittals that result and that there are social costs um, with that. Also, keep in mind that most uh, few, if any, other countries use the exclusionary rule approach that we have in the United States. Um, even the common law countries uh, like Australia and Canada and England, instead, they have a couple different approaches. They're more likely to let's say, um, admit the evidence, but then punish the police officers, right? Um, so uh, sanction them or um, get them in trouble somehow for violating people's rights or the police can be sued in a lot of countries that don't have the same type of qualified immunity that they would hear. Um, or um, in some countries, they will convict the defendant. They'll admit, allow the evidence to come in but if the evidence was obtained in violation of their rights, they will issue uh, um, enter a stay of the proceedings before sentencing. And so therefore the person basically is convicted so that we have some resolution about what happened and we know that we can't, won't charge someone else with a crime, let's say, um, but they won't actually uh, be punished. And so then let's talk about whether there are indirect costs of the exclusionary rules. Um, of course, there's people who would argue that there are higher crime rates, the more guilty defendants actually uh, get off um, and or are acquitted. Um, maybe there's more plea bargains because of the exclusionary rules. So the, um, if the d prosecutor or district attorney knows that there's a question about whether the a confession or evidence obtained during a, an uh, unlawful search, a search without a warrant will be admissible, they might be more incentive, uh, motivated to offer a really generous plea deal rather than take their chances at trial um, and risk that that evidence will be excluded. Um, there's also a question that's been argued, and I've argued this in some of my earlier academic writings, that police will substitute surveillance um, uh, for beforehand for investigations or rely more on sting operations, right? So if we make it hard for police to gather evidence after a crime has been committed, we, basically we create an incentive for law enforcement to just engage in a lot more watching everybody all the time, um, or uh, the government listening to phone conversations or uh, tracking your social media uh, use and so forth, hoping to uh, catch something, um, or uh, using sting operations, basically, so that they can get the crime on video. They can schedule it ahead of time. Now, uh, here's the why I'm making this video. Some Supreme Court justices, usually conservatives on the court, have adopted this approach called um, marginal deterrence in cases where a defendant is proposing an extension, uh, 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 extending the applications of these exclusionary rules for fourth, uh, the Fourth and Fifth Amendment, especially um, asking um, how much additional marginal deterrence of police misconduct would result. The court then compares this additional marginal deterrence against uh, police uh, violating suspects' rights uh, against the um, additional marginal cost of implementing the exclusionary rule. And you, uh, every time I've a uh, case I found where they discuss this, they decide that the marginal costs of expanding the exclusionary rules to new, um, uh, new situations outweigh the additional marginal benefit of the proposed extension in terms of keeping the police in line. And this is just a graph um, to remind my students, I have a whole other video in our course or lecture about um, diminishing marginal returns or marginal benefit. And the idea is uh, from the, for purposes of, of this analysis, if we already have exclusionary rules, um, the police already know that they're going to have problems. The case is going to have problems if they uh, violate um, constitutional rights and Maybe we, we've already kind of hit the maximum in terms of how much deterrent effect we're going to get from these. We don't need to just keep expanding them. Maybe it, we, it won't actually have any additional effect on police behavior or give any like benefit of protection to the citizenry. Um, this first, the Supreme Court first invoked this marginal deterrence analysis 
back in 1966 in the case United States versus Blue, the defendant wanted, um, instead of just having uh, evidence excluded, he wanted to have his case dismissed altogether, um, and um, which would have been a way of extending the exclusionary rule um, but but with to give it more bite that it basically it results in an automatic dismissal and keep in mind for my students even let's say uh, let's say you, you, you the defendant confessed to the crime when they were arrested but the police didn't give them the Miranda warnings so even if that confession do, doesn't come in we can still put the person on trial and um, use any other evidence whatever uh, evidence uh, the police had apart from that, a particular confession. So if we have other eyewitnesses or clues that led the police to this particular suspect and so forth, that would be still be admissible. And so I pull out some qu quotes from this because the earlier cases, they really go into detail about this type of analysis. Our numerous precedents ordering the exclusion of such illegally obtained evidence assume implicitly that the remedy does not extend to barring the prosecution altogether. So far, so good. Um, such a drastic step might advance marginally some of the ends served by the exclusionary rules, but it would also increase to an intolerable degree interference with the public interest in having the guilty brought to book or basically convicted. And so here they're talking about uh, conceding maybe there would be a little bit, bit of additional or marginal um, uh, deterrence of police misconduct, but um, not that much more. Um, this additional contribution if any, of the consideration of search and seizure claims of state prisoners on collateral review is small in relation to the costs. And to be sure, each case in which such a claim is considered may add marginally to an awareness of the values protected by the Fourth Amendment. So again, I'm quoting this because it, this is um, a really great example of a court using economic analysis um, for a type of evidentiary ruling about suppressing evidence or admitting it. There's no reason to believe that, um, oh, this is a, a, a case from 10 years later, State v. Powell. Um, the Supreme Court said there's no reason to believe that the overall educative effect of the exclusionary rule would be appreciably diminished if search and seizure claims could not be raised in federal habeas corpus review of state convictions. So in other words, um, the defendant was trying to get the exclusionary rules uh, um, applied to habeas petitions as well, not just a criminal trial. And the court basically said no, because they said that there would be no um, additional um, uh, marginal value to that. <clears throat> they continue, nor is there reason to assume that any specific disincentive already created by the risk of exclusion of evidence at trial or the reversal of convictions on direct review would be enhanced if there were the further risk that a conviction obtained in state court and affirmed on direct review might be overturned in collateral proceedings often occurring years after the incarceration of the defendant. Um, and the view that the deterrence of the Fourth Amendment violations would be furthered rests on the dubious assumption that law enforcement authorities would fear that federal habeas review might reveal flaws in a search and seizure that went undetected at trial and on appeal. In other words, they're, they're very skeptical that the police, when they're actually doing an investigation and deciding whether to get a warrant, let's say, are thinking, okay, even if we convict this guy, what if years down the road, um, he gets out on a habeas petition because of us not getting the warrant today? They th the court says that's too far off and too attenuated to have any real Im impact on police, how the police do their work. So even if one rationally could assume that some additional incremental deterrent effect would be presented in isolated cases, the resulting advance of the legitimate goal of furthering Fourth Amendment rights would be outweighed by acknowledge by the acknowledged cost to other values vital to a rational system of criminal justice. In another more recent case, Herring versus United States, the court also invoked this and said the benefits of deterrence must outweigh the costs. Again, uh, in more recent cases, they've just kind of they've kind of tightened their analysis, or there's less um, a, of a lengthy discussion. The principal cost of applying the rule is, of course, letting a guilty and possibly dangerous defendants go free. So that concludes my um, discussion of this. Uh, we still get cases about this, quite a few cases where the Supreme Court is using expri explicitly marginal analysis. Now, the interesting thing about this is that the, they're doing this because they're saying that our exclusionary rule is essentially prophylactic, right? It's a means to an end. 
So we want to protect people's Fourth Amendment rights, Fifth Amendment rights, and Sixth Amendment rights. And the way we're going to do that is to um, basically exclude evidence that police get kind of mostly to punish the police and teach the police a lesson if they ignore the warrant requirement or they don't give someone their Miranda rights. And so the interesting question is why the Supreme Court hasn't done this in other areas of constitutional law with rules that the constitutional rights that they also describe or protections as essentially prophylactic. So for example, in recent Second Amendment cases, the court has been talking about the Second Amendment as basically there to protect a core right of personal self-defense, right? So the, the whole idea of not infringing um, on uh, the, the right to bear arms is really a means to an end to protect people's right to have self-defense. So again, if the Second Amendment is essentially a prophylactic rule, then the question is whether a court should also apply this type of marginal um, deterrent effect and say, well, look, the person's core right of self-defense is also being protected by a whole sort of constellation of um, of statutes and other legal protections. So we have a legal defense of self-defense. We have immunity for gun manufacturers um, and against uh, tort suits. We have um, a, a, a constitutional carry uh, um, in a lot of states, um, preemption. So we have a, a large statutory framework essentially protects gun rights or the rights of gun owners already. So then there's a question of whether extending the Second Amendment protections to in yet further than they have been before really adds any marginal value um, to the protections that are already in place from previous either Second Amendment cases or statutes that are basically designed to protect the rights of gun owners or the right uh, of self-defense. So this is an interesting issue that, the, to my knowledge, the court is only doing this type of marginal an analysis in the um, uh, sort of exclusionary rule setting. But in theory, this type of idea could be applied to other areas of constitutional rights.